because some people have looked at it and they go, oh, and they kind of shrug their shoulders as if the patriarch had said, well, in order to be a mariner, you also have to learn how to speak Swahili. <laughs> and it's like, oh, well, yeah, maybe, but it's not that big. And it reminded me of when I first went to the seminary. So at the age of 19, you're at the seminary, and like any other 19-year-old, I have to say the first weekends that would come around and you're sitting there on Friday night just staring at a wall in a, the, what is, really would be called a cell. I mean, it is a small room that we have, just a bed and a desk and a sink, and that's it. Some of you saw them, what the rooms looked like. They recognized immediately the rooms at, at, at Mercy Academy when we were walking through the convent section. Yeah, I know these rooms. So this time they had been enlarged. So since there were no sisters really left in the building, they started breaking down walls and making them into two, two rooms and making them much bigger. But you could see where the original walls were. Yeah, I recognize this room. There's a little sink and a little table and a little bed. And usually the bed is broken. And so, you know, you're just in pain. And that's just the way it is. But at 19 on a Friday night, at the end of a week of studies, and now you're sitting in a room for hours on Friday night, and it's completely quiet in the whole building because it's a study time. And just staring at the wall, thinking, what the heck am I doing? No, I, I've told a number of you, I absolutely hated seminary when I first got there. I hated it. And I would get up in the morning, and I would look in that mirror over that little tiny sink in the room on the third floor of a building that had no insulation, so the room was absolutely freezing. And I would look in the mirror, and I would think, what, what are you doing here? You can walk into the village that this seminary is outside of. You have a credit card. New York is only an hour and a half away by train. And there is no reason why you have to be doing this. And of course, with the education I had received by my parents was, well, the, the other voice that then came in, the first voice was, this is insane. And the second voice said, but if you don't persevere, you'll never know. And so I was basically in a quandary where you had to keep going to see what is here. And I have to say it's the same thing with all of the patrimony that we have in our church. Why did these people, monks, sisters, lay people, why did they do the things that the patriarch is talking about in this letter for centuries? And the other aspect of the seminary training was just purely the silence. Nothing. And, you know, having grown up like any other person in the 20th century, you know, you have your stereo, you have your LPs in those days, right? So, you had music, and music in the car. There's always noise. Of course, we didn't live like now when the television is always on and background noise. But still, when you got to the seminary, 21 hours out of 24 were silent. We had 45 minutes of recreation after lunch that you could talk. And we had another 45 minutes of recreation after dinner that you could talk. 
And other than that, you could talk in the 10 minute periods between lectures, in the morning and in the afternoon. That's it. So that makes up another three or four 10 minute periods. <coughs> And it was the same thing. I would sit here at this desk in this room, and the only thing that was making noise were the crows outside in the woods, the trees that surrounded the buildings. And you think, I'm going to go out of my mind. Because what silence immediately makes you do is realize what's going through your head. And you have to confront everything that you actually are made up of in the silence. It is why the world has an absolute terror of silence. It's why when I've preached the Ignatian exercises, which is five days of perfect silence, there's no breaks just from the moment you get there until the day you leave five days later, it's perfectly silent. The meals are, well, there's reading during the meals, but it's perfectly silent. And it was not rare that on the very first day, People would be gone by that evening. They would arrive at 1 o'clock from the airport, and then at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, that exact same afternoon, I have a seminarian come and tell me, oh, well, Father, in room 302, it's empty. Because they just took their things out and they left, because they couldn't even deal with the first three hours of a building which is just quiet anyways, because we would preach these at the seminary. But what I have to tell you with absolute fundamental conviction is that once you break through the wall of silence, there is nothing more beautiful, more serene, and more strengthening than that silence, and the mastery that it forces you to embrace. And so, by the time I reached the first semester at seminary, it's like, well, maybe this isn't so awful, though I still don't like it. <laughs> and by the second semester as well, you still don't know because it's only a first year, and this is a six-year course. And so coming back the next year, you wind up entering into it. And by the end of the second year, it makes sense. And by the third year, though it took me three years, by third year it was just perfect beauty and peace. But this takes years. This is not something that just happens because we decide that next Tuesday we're going to fast. And that's going to make us jubilant. No. You have to fast day in and day out, week after week, and then do it again next year. And then do it again next year by sheer willpower. And maybe at that point, we will understand the harmony and the peace that the ancestors embraced and the fathers and the mothers in our church. That's all I want to bring up, just on a personal, I am witnessing. All right? I'm just telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you. Amen. <laughs> because, like I said, the practical thing that I want you to do, you can see in the question of perseverance where we're coming to. All right? Now, I, if we come down to two people here, I'm not going to do the class. So if people are sitting home just to watch this in the convenience of whenever they want to watch it, <laughs> we're not going to always be recording, and I'm not going to be talking to an empty room. That's just, you know for those who are watching at a distance, yes. You do have a person that called me, cannot be here tonight, that's and fine. was so hoping that's fine. he but was that's, recording. Yeah. No, that's and they fine. are always here. Yes, yes. Well, that's why last year when everyone was kind of like, oh, look at this, this is really good. I said, yeah, well, just wait. Initial actions and good intentions are infinite. But perseverance on the path requires exactly what we call virtue. I mean, the word virtue itself, I mean, it's not meant to be chauvinistic, but the word itself, vir, V-I-R in Latin, means male. What the word virtue literally means in Latin is manliness, strength. The last night we were doing the catechism class with the boys and explaining them meekness. The strength that is required to control the emotional reaction of anger. Why these are questions of strength. So fasting, this discipline, this will, this engagement, is because, is it essential? No, it's not essential. But it is all of the armory and the tools that strengthen us continually, which is why the word is fast in English, strengthen. 
So the challenge that I want to give you, and I only point out the numbers because what I'm giving you as a challenge is that I would like you to get two Maronites, each of you, as a resolution, did you get two Maronites to read this letter? Just read it. It's not a fast or anything, just read it. Because you watch a lot of people squirm, they may know of something, but they don't actually want to read it because then they'll say they didn't know. Which well, one letter are we talking about? The, patri the Patriarch's letter. We started last week. Oh, okay. Oh, it's okay. I had a kidney stone last week. So. Oh, okay. It's okay. You know, we don't need to do I, I, I don't know anything. It's okay. It's going on. So, it's we're, we're, we're going to continue yeah, on. It's so online. I'm asking you as, as a resolution. I made up 40 copies today. And so they will be at the doorways. Okay. It's just a question. And I'm not saying just even the Maronites who are in the pews. Because oh. they will hear the announcement on Sunday and Saturday. Your cousins. Know, who never show up for liturgy. You get them to say the patriarch has reiterated our tradition. And the reason why I bring this up is because if we are not faithful to our tradition, God will close this church. Because there's no reason why a Maronite church should be here if Maronites aren't even being Maronites. Because that's the way God works. <laughs> it's just not, you can't expect for any kind of exceptional miracle if we're not even trying. God always expects that personal engagement and reciprocation. And so if on the reciprocal side, God is always faithful, as St. Paul reiterates numerous times. God is always waiting to make this real. But if we can't reciprocate it on our end, we have no reason to expect that he will sustain us in a miraculous manner. And so that's why when the patriarch comes out to reiterate what being a Maronite and these practices around the great fast are, it's an extremely important point. For last year when we got this letter, and it came out at the end of Lent, which is why I didn't put it out last year, why I put it out for Easter week. Except that it's not, it's not just about Lent, it's about the whole year. I mean, some of you have already read the whole thing, which is great. We're going to go through it piece by piece. He talks about the whole year. This is a practice. This is not, and this is where you have to start disengaging what the Latins are doing down the street. That's not us. We have our own tradition. And the Latins may do one thing or another. For example, you see the patriarch never talks about any end of abstinence. He doesn't say, he just says, let's just start at the age of reason. You know? Whereas the Latins will have their canonical specifications coming up. So, what I throw out as a challenge to you, besides you know, engaging you personally with the letter, <laughs> is that you, as an apostolic outreach, in a sense, try to verify that you can get two Maronites to read it. Tell them this is, it, it's, it's one of the most beautiful things I've read. You know, a few years ago, the, the, the patriarch did something on social action, and it was nice. But it's not the engagement of what has made Maronites be the martyrs that they've been over the centuries. So, you know, I don't want to be melodramatic, so I'm just saying, I am not telling you by giving you the example at the beginning of silence and of the discipline of the seminary, of the monasteries. All I can do is just, as I say, witness and testify and tell you, if you do it long enough, you will break through that barrier of fear and you will understand why this has sustained centuries of people. The problem is that we are such a timid and frightful people that we can engage in nothing in an persevering manner. And what we do long term, we do only because it feels good. And that's why the world looks the way it is, because when things stop feeling good, then we just fall into this kind of darkness of despair. On the fasting aspect, and the discipline that he talked about on this mystery of penance, these are things that bring light into our life. So the way that we engage with God's redemption. And so, you know, the first part, so we'll go to the letter now. Well, we're going to go continue on from where we left off last week. So, you know, we talked about in the first section the, the fruits. We talked about Passover. We talked about the notion of movement from life to death. And this passing over then to the new life and the fruits, the flourishing that come from it. So you have the best copies because I made booklets. The ones that are coming out this weekend at the doors are just simply sheets taken together on the phone. 
There are perks for showing up on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> so is the traditions um, that you're talking about, which are pretty much biblical at this point, right? Oh, yeah, for the most um, sure. But they go back to 400? Oh, even before that. I mean, before from the very the, beginning. I mean, from the talks, very beginning, okay. When you have the ordination of the apostles in the Acts of the Apostles, they talk about fasting and prayer and imposition of hands. They okay, right so the these beginning. are the new... Yeah, because the fasting... The new way that God... The fasting is what the Jews are doing in the Old Testament. So, I mean, this is this predates Christianity. Fasting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, so... But, Part of the problem why in the modern world we have a hard time with fasting is because we are such gluttons the other days of the year. You know, when you only have a short, you know, most people didn't eat a lot of meat. One, you couldn't afford it. And so, you're, you know, your life, you know, on occasion you might have meat for a big holiday. So giving up meat wasn't a huge thing for people in practice. And so their lives, in a sense, were also, because they were more, I won't say hard, I mean, you know, sometimes we portray the, the past generations as people just living away, you know, eking out, you know, picking out, you know, grubs out of the dirt. Which is not that at all. People, you know, how did you think you ever got Situ's recipes if they weren't actually cooking you know, 300 years ago? And so, those reasons. But, of course, how, what do they do? They make nice things with lentils. I mean, so, they're not doing it with filet mignon. It's just not something they would have. But, so, part of the difficulty, and it's understandable, that in the modern world, we have this difficulty. But that's the reason why I would say what you note in the letter is the patriarch says, these are obligatory for the first week of Lent, and for Passion Week, all the way through Saturday. He doesn't say, don't do anything in the middle weeks of Lent. But he says, you have to at least apply yourself for these two weeks. Right? The Latins don't say anything like that. You know, you get two days. Ash Wednesday, Good Friday, and that's it. But of course, quite honestly, psychologically, and at the level of willpower, if you really only, out of 365 days, Try to make an effort to eat only one meal and fast on two days out of 365. You're just a mess. You can't even you can't even really try to do that. You start dying, you know, by the time you know 10 a.m. rolls around, because we're not we're not strengthened in it. And so you know he talks about the abstinence on Fridays throughout the whole year for fasting. So anyway, that's one of the things. So when we talk about the traditions, fasting in that predate. Remember, John the Baptist is in the wilderness eating honey and locusts. And they always talk about, are these actually really insects that he's eating? Yeah, it's quite possible. A lot of protein. Protein. Right? Protein. Protein. <laughs> so, as we've always talked about, the word tradition, all it means, traditio, is from the Latin word tradere. We've done this before. It's always good to kind of remind you. Philadelphia means to hand over something. So the word tradition and the word trader actually have the same origin. You know, what does a trader do? A trader hands over his country, his community, his nation, he betrays it. And <coughs> tradition is what is handed to us by our predecessors, our ancestors. The fathers, mothers, brothers, sisters that we continually come back to all the time in our prayers regularly. And so these are, you know, important points to understand. And well, as we mentioned last week, it's clear that what the patriarch is doing here is trying to get a sense of conversion, which is repentance in our lives, to keep always understanding that we always have another step to take in our lives. Again, it's not to make us neurotic, it's just to understand the better that I know myself, the more that I know how I can be better by the light of grace. That's why we keep talking about the light of grace. If you read the prayer that we've done for three weeks, day after day for the weekdays, it asks that you illuminate the heart, that you illuminate the minds of the nations, of the people, so that they turn to you. And that you soften their hearts so that they can learn to know you and to love you. It's in the Husoyo. Very beautiful. Those are the graces of Lent, and that's what the patriarch is clearly trying to do. Now, as we mentioned here, then, we talked about the question of, let's see, on page, page four. Because we were talking, he's talking about the sacramental mysteries that are here. And at the top of page four, you'll notice when he talks about the sacrament, 
What is the purpose of going to confession? It's, and Pope Francis has brought this up also. It's, it's not a laundry mat. We're not going in just to be clean. We are going in because we are maturing in our faith and recognizing in the divine light where we've tripped up and where we need to go forward. That's all. We know, we know that in any case, in, this, in the mystery of penance, this is only between me and God. This has nothing to do with anyone else. We talk about the abuse that's going on within the church and all that, but thanks be to God, really, more fundamentally, we haven't heard of any priest violating the sacrament of penance or anything. You know, the seal, the famous seal, that Alfred Hitchcock made sealed lips about. You all watch that with Montgomery Clifford? Oh, well, you should. It's, well, first of all, it's a Hitchcock film, so it's got to have suspense in it. No, it's, it's, about a, it's about a priest who's basically being framed by a murderer who has gone to confession of the murder to this priest. So the priest knows exactly who murdered this person. So what happens in this film? Because you can't, under any circumstances, even if you must die, ever violate the sacrament of penance as Christ's minister. Okay. What about to protect another? Like if they never, say they're never, 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 nope. Not, no. not to. Because, you, because the minister actually doesn't know this <clears throat> as a man. He knows none of these things. So even on the, and, and all of the states of the union at this point recognize that as a reason why the priest on the stand can be asked nothing of those questions. St. John Neopumacine, the great Czech bishop, probably, he died because of the sacrament. Because he was confessor to the court and the king suspected that his wife, the queen, was being adulterous. And he tried to force the bishop to reveal what she had been confessing. He wouldn't give it. So eventually the king in a rage just had him executed, killed him. Killed him and had, threw his body into the river, to the Maldon. And it was discovered because this great light, this orb, appeared over the water. And that's how they discovered the body. So to this day, if you go to Prague, even after all communism there for, for, for decades, you will find on one of the bridges over the Moldau, you will find a bishop standing there, a little statue. Bishop will be standing there, and he has one finger over his lips. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you see that, you know that that is St. John the Apomacy. Mm -hmm. yes. Can a priest do anything to prevent something from happening if they know that someone's no. planning on harming someone? No, because you don't know it. Once you leave that confessional, you don't know anything that comes out of that confession. So even as even on the moral level, but I would say the moral problems that we've had going on and apparently sucking another bishop into it in Virginia these days is because these men didn't fast. These men were not disciplined. Do you remember Father Gagan in the first place? Father Gagan in the 1990s when he was arrested. What was Gagan arrested for? Gagan was arrested because he was in a public pool trying to pull down the swimsuit of a 15-year-old boy. Well, in my opinion, the priest shouldn't even be at the public pool. Right. I mean, that's just not proper. You're a different being by being a priest. And the more you understand the priesthood, it doesn't make you a different, it doesn't make you an extraterrestrial. But it means that the things that the world will do is not open to you to do, otherwise don't become a priest. Yes. I don't want to belabor this, but doesn't that speak to why bishops did not um, punish priests who confessed their sins of pedophile and all. No, because at that point, it's, when you have parents come to you and tell you in your office that this has happened to their children, that's not confessional. No, but if the if the priest happened to a no, but that's not but that's nothing to do with it. They okay. were protected. So if it comes priest. from another source, you can you can talk about it. But absolutely from the actual as you can with any kind okay. of other professional. At that point, it's a professional secret. Gotcha. Okay. Doctors, lawyers. So the things that you know professionally. And we know that, you know, morally, ethically, there are, there are times, there are extreme times, but there are times when you can use that knowledge and, and you need to act on it. But the confessional is not this world. That's gotcha. the thing. It is not, it is a divine mystery. It's not something, it's, he's, not a, he's not a counselor. It's also why one of the first things from the day I arrived here was to fix this confessional. This is, not a, this is not a Freudian counseling room where we put the, you've all seen them, I'm sure, 
you go into these reconciliation rooms and there's a plastic rhododendron in the corner and it's all carpeted and it's all set up like you're going in to see your, your, your psychiatrist. But that's not, that could be a benefit, getting things off your chest, but that's not the purpose of the sacrament. Well, we've treated it that way. Of course, now it's been beautifully reworked. Sue and her brother did this. It's absolutely lovely. And it's completely the way it's supposed to be according to the canons. You want to go face to face, they can go face to face. But also the first option is they can come in and they can just do these things anonymously. And so we have to have a long way to kind of patch this all up. You know, everything's broken. I don't mean to sound dramatic, but everything has been kicked around, busted up. And I think that what was happening in the 70s and the 80s and all that was the idea of a false sense of compassion. And so these priests are doing this. I mean, in the canons of the church, um, you know, these bishops were meant to rip these men's teeth out of their faces because they have betrayed the most profound sense of trust, which is the divine paternity that has been graced them by the imposition of hands. But in the kind of, you know, post-60s world that we've lived in, it's all about emotions and it's all about feelings and it's all about, I would say, a false sense of compassion. And that is what is behind these things. Okay? Now, they tried to make it look professional by sending them off to a psychiatric ward or whatever. And then saying now they've gone through their therapy. Don't worry about it, Steve. Can't sit still. <laughs> now we're how, how about the Roman? The Roman directives that are, are they over our Maronite directives? On fasting? We just should be stopped. No, but we can, we can follow the Maronite traditions, for example, yeah, they're just um, sure. without having to deal with the Roman ones. Jesus is who I was saying. Right, we're all Catholics. Right, that's right. But yeah. there are yeah. some that don't, correct? Don't what? Overlap. Oh yeah. Well, like you see in the letter here, he talks about you know the fast and absence every Friday throughout the year. Mm -hmm. The Romans don't do that at all. The Romans Fridays are left for abstinence from meat on during Lent. All right. So just so, you know, to point out this, the patriarch points out this idea of what is going on in the sacrament of penance is is this question of conversion within the light. And I mentioned, even in the Eastern traditions, you know, everyone in the parish would just go, go to confession, mention something, and just come up in front of the iconostasis. We mentioned that last week. All right, so, we also mentioned the fact that in the sacrament itself, like every other mystery, you give what is called a sacramental grace, okay? So, within every single sacrament, every single mystery, okay, there is a divine gift, right? A grace, what we call a grace. Grace, the word just means gift, right? And within the mystery, there is sanctifying grace, that which makes us rectify, healing us before God. It's what makes us pleasing to God, sanctifying grace. We are pleasing to God, yes, in the sense that we're created, but so are the trees and the bunny rabbits. But for the human beings and the angels to be pleasing to God is because they participate in the life for which he created them, which is his own. It's not sufficient. In any case, it doesn't even exist. You are either in the state of grace or you are in the state of mortal sin. You are one or the other if you are not a child before the age of reason or somehow limited in your faculties. Every human being, every conscious adult is either in the state of mortal sin or the state of grace. It has always been that way. There has never been a natural state of man. Adam and Eve were created in grace. There has never been a state in which just simply we're just pure nature. That's a theory of Rousseau that comes in in the 18th century romanticism. Now, so in grace, one of the things, the primary thing that is given, of course, is sanctifying grace. But the one thing that most people are not aware of is also what we call sacramental grace. And sacramental grace is something which is geared or pegged or formed according to the mystery. So, for example, this is something which is an establishment 
for the future of actual grace. So sanctifying grace is a question of existential state. That we are in a state which is pleasing to God. We participate in the infinite, in the intimate divine charity, the divine love, and the family of God, which is the triune hidden one. Sacramental grace, actual grace. So if you remember your catechism, or if you don't, I'll just give you the definition again. So actual grace, actus, the word act in Latin is doing something. The word in Latin is agere, agere. It's used, agere bello means to wage war. So agere is not just something do. Do, is a, do is, a, is, a, is a Welsh Celtic helping verb that we have in English, do. That's why it doesn't really have much strength in its sound. But, so it's more than just doing something. Agere is the establishment or the, 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 the building of something in a sense. And so the word actus, act, is that which is adjure, that which is established, that which is placed, that which is made. So adjure is a much stronger word, so agere or adjure. So when the word actual, it means that which is established, it's an adjective, actualis. So the thing which is being established, so what is then being established? is whatever the mystery is. So for example, baptism. Baptism is not joining Kiwanis. Right? Baptism makes us the children of God. And it doesn't just simply make us a Catholic. It makes us, with actual grace, to be a saint. Marriage is not just simply, okay, now you're married, now, now you can have sex, now actually legitimately, instead of all the premarital stuff you've been doing. <laughs> That's not what marriage is about. And in fact, it was an impediment until these last decades to be living in concubinage and go to the church. If you were living in concubinage, you would refuse to be married. It was called public propriety. And it was considered completely indecent that you would be living publicly as husband and wife, and then show up at the altar from that same apartment, <laughs> and then after a vacation, go back to the same apartment. It was considered completely undignified. So when I used to do marriages, we don't have to worry about that here, but when I used to do marriages, I would tell them, I said, look, you know, I tell one of the spouses, you know, I said, look, just go back and stay with your parents for six months, all right? Just, just fix this for the moment, okay? And they would do it, you know. But, but we don't even think in those terms anymore. So that when the mystery of matrimony is accomplished, it's not just so you can have sex and no one's going to bat an eye, because no one bats an eye when you have sex today anyway. But it's the establishment of the, the reflection and the extension of Christ of the church here and now. This man is consecrated as Christ within this domestic situation, and this woman is consecrated as the body, the mystic body of Christ as the church within this domestic situation. So that what matrimony is doing is not just simply saying, you, okay, you're together now. It is establishing you not just simply to be husband and wife, it's establishing you to be saintly husband and wife, meaning as a mini version of the Christ and a mini version of Holy Mother Church. Totally different idea, isn't it? Totally different idea. Which is why in the Eastern tradition, if you are not married with the presence of a priest, the priest confers this mystery upon the couple. It's not just a contractual exchange like in the Latin church. If you have, there's no question of you being in, invalid. You're not married. You're simply not married. Because you are a baptized member of Christ. How can you join yourself in a carnal way with someone which is not holy? So the actual grace is that what God promises us to us in the mystery is that in the future there is actual grace to allow us to live according to that mystery. Our religion is so profoundly beautiful, so transcendently sublime. That's actually what I consider the greatest disgrace, is that we haven't communicated this for so many generations. 
Because when you start seeing it, it just leaves your jaw drop because you're thinking, I have a new, I just never thought of this. So that when we, what the, what the patriarch is bringing up, that when we go to confession, so remember we talked about last week the three parts. There is contrition, I understand what I have done. That's the first thing, I have to know that I've done something. And we mentioned last week that contrition literally means in Latin to be broken up. You know. So some, we do something stupid in our family, our family is whatever. We, we ruin it because Uncle John was a gambler and so now the family's in destitution because of this. Okay. And we'll say, you know, it's horrible what's happened to Uncle John's family. I've broken up about it. You know, it means, you know, I really, this has really, you know, bruised me emotionally, psychologically, because my nieces and nephews are really good kids and it's a shame they have to go through this. Being broken up, that's literally what contrition means. I am broken up because my conversation is this way. Because my actions are this way. Because of the things that I pursue in life are this way. That's contrition. I'm, it means I've come to the realization, I mature within the divine light to understand that this is really, wow, I'm really off the path. That's the first step. Confession is within the mystery then. We confess. We say outwardly before God what we have done. That's the confession part. Okay? Then, of course, we have... The amendment, the purpose of amendment. Because after all, if I'm broken up over Uncle John's gambling, I would do what I can to help them. Of course, anyone who's worked with gamblers knows that that's really kind of hard. But you, you would do what you could to help them. The purpose of amendment means I'm broken up over the way my life is actually oriented. I recognize this before the divine light, before God. Like I said, in the Eastern tradition, when you have an iconostasis, you're actually facing and talking to the icon of Christ. The priest is standing next to you, listening, to give you absolution, the judgment and absolution. Then you kneel down in front of him, he puts a stole on your head and pronounces absolution. We don't do that, the Romans don't do that, but to this day there is still the gesture through the screen of the hand being raised, at least it's supposed to be. From the old days when the Latins did the same thing, they imposed hands upon the person being absolved. Then, in that confession, it's because I intend to actually get onto the path. I intend to do what I can with God's help. Well, that's the purpose of amendment. And what the, what the patriarch is pointing out is that there is the sacramental grace is what links in here, if you want. It's this second and third part. This part is conversion. This is the part in which I come to understand in my little 19-year-old pea brain that silence is a beautiful thing. And in my 20-year-old heart, that Friday night is not just for frivolity. That is the conversion process, to enter deeper and deeper into the light. The confession and this purpose of amendment is what's linking on the actual graces, okay? This is the um, the actual grace being conferred that we call the sacramental grace. And what actual grace is, the simple idea of, simple, of actual grace is, it is the illumination of the mind and the strengthening of the will to do good and avoid evil. <coughs> Voila. Very simple. It is God's action within our lives to illuminate the mind Strengthen the will, the faculty of choice, to do good and to avoid evil. I mean, actual grace is going on here. You know, before I ever figure out, you know, how screwed up my life is and my conversion, God's already working within me. How do you think I ever come to the knowledge of the fact that, you know, that I, I need to be, you know, shifting some of this around? Is because there's already an illumination of the mind going on. It's always God's initiative. And he's strengthening me to say, this is not terrifying. You can do this. Strengthening the will to do good and to avoid evil. So the question of conversion, what the good he's moving us towards, is the understanding and wisdom of really what my life should look like within Christ. The actual grace over here 
is that he allows us to live according to the mystery in its fullness. So as I mentioned, when we're baptized, it's not just simply to be a Catholic. It's to be a saint. That's why at the end, in the Latin rite, they hand you a candle. And all the rites, you're garbed in white. Because you are now among the children of God. And the candle in the Latin rite, which is very... Well, we have candles, we use them. But the candle that's handed off symbolizes the faith. At that point, usually in the Baptist might tell them, the prayers in the Latin rite are very clear. May you continue to carry this so that on the day of judgment, when God, our Lord appears with all of his angels, that you may enter into the banquet of eternal bliss, the banquet of the Lamb. Yes? Why do we do baptism and confession at the same sacrament in the Maronite faith? Baptism and chrismation. Whatever, yeah. Uh, confirmation, I meant. Well, because it, uh, it mentioned last week is that in the baptismal ceremony, the East never developed a baby ceremony. The Latins have two ceremonies, one for adults and one for children, babies. And the baby one is slightly shorter, traditionally. Um, but it's kind of the one we only use really now. Most people don't even know what the old adult rite was. Whereas in the East, the rite was just simply the old rite that we always had, which was in the first generations, of course, adult conversions. I mean, babies were being baptized within families. And more and more as generations moved to the early centuries. But of course, the initial people, Pentecost and all, these are adults. And so the idea was in their adulthood, they're receiving the two perfecting maturations. One, to establish them as the children of God. And then chrismation, to establish them with the plenitude of the Holy Spirit working within their lives. And why do we pick out, I called it a confirmation name because that's what we called it. Yeah. Why do we pick out a day? Like I pick Bernadette. You pick a patron for any of the major life changes that you go through. So for example, every time I was ordained to a minor order, exorcist, acolyte, porter, lector, subdeacon, deacon, major orders, priesthood, I chose a saint as a patron. And, and I, when I prepared marriages, I would tell them, choose a patron saint of your matrimony. And so in baptism, your patron saint is, well, normally as a child, as a baby, the name your parents are to I mean, these days they're just completely outlandish so many times, it's like, I don't know what this name is about. But, you know, up until, again, the 1980s, you were required positively to choose a saint's name. It's not like it's a limited, I mean, it's a huge, you know, there are thousands of names you can choose from. It's not like it's really limited. But up until the 80s, that only changes in canon law in the 1980s. Now the canon is, you're not allowed to choose a name which would be offensive to the Christian faith. So you can't name somebody Hitler or something like that. <laughs> no. No. Oh, I had a funny baptism once. We're going to stop for our coffee then. But I once had a funny baptism. It took place, it was, I always remember, it was December 31st in the Latin calendar. December 31st is the feast of Pope St. Sylvester. And he's one of the popes at the time of the whole conversion under Constantine and the Empire. And this family that had seven children, right? and they were all boys, he finally had one daughter at the end. They bring me in the midst of this, these children, they bring me a little baby, and the family says, his name's Joseph. And I said, do you know how many Josephs we have in this school? You know, we used to, that year it was the joke because first grade you got 28 kids and just boys because it was just the boys' school for the parochial our school, and then up the hill was the Dominicans for the girls' school. But in this class of like 26 boys, literally 18 of them were Joseph. <laughs> and I said, you know, we have such a rich patrimony of saints. Can you not pick something else? And then I looked him in the eye, the father, and I said, December 31st. We're going to baptize in Sylvester. Awesome. <laughs> no, you wouldn't do that. Well, of course, this kid's now 25, right? So, so it's very funny. So we got to the baptismal. I did actually throw it in as a secondary name, but his name is Joseph. <laughs> well, what was funny is his older brothers. I mean, they were you know, a lot older. They were, you know, 8 and 10 and all that. They started calling the baby at home. Sill. <laughs> but it's, that's the kind of, you know, richness that we have. But the importance then for the, so, to finish before we have our caffeine break, 
the actual grace of the sacrament of penance, then, is precisely to have the strength, the illumination and the strength, to overcome what I have just presented in the mystery. So it is the greatest help for us to advance along the paths of holiness. It's not a laundromat just to go in and say, okay, fine, now I'm good to go. I mean, someone could say that, I suppose. But that's not the purpose. It's that not only have I received sanctifying grace, and it's because sanctifying grace is given that we talk about sins being forgiven. It's because the presence of grace enters this individual that sin necessarily has to be expulsed. It's not that we empty it out and leave you like in the parable of the man who was possessed and the demon is cast out and the demon wanders in the desert and it's like, well, this is really the pits. So I'm going to go back home. And when he gets back home, he finds the place clean and neat and empty. And so he goes and gets seven other demons with him and the man's state is worse than it was in the beginning. Yes. It's a strange parable when you first hear it. So what happens if somebody goes to confession, but they actually aren't sorry for what they've done? They're just, you know, uh, do they actually end up not getting that sanctification? That's right. Actually, what they wind up doing at that point is committing a sacrilege, because they're abusing the mystery. And I, I'm quite honestly, I've only had a couple times in 30 years, and I've heard lots and 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 lots. And lots. Here I get to say the rosary, but in other parishes, I actually, I know, we joke because you know, I, a line from here down to the wall, that was a normal Sunday between the masses, before the mass and between the masses. They were already lining up. People coming for 10 o'clock mass were already getting in line at 9:30 or at, at 9 o'clock, coming earlier for the 10 o'clock mass and getting in line and waiting. Here I'm still trying to shift them of please don't come at 9.45 and have me hear a confession because you'll make mass late 10 minutes like we did last Sunday. So if you want to go to, if you want to, go to confession, that is beautiful and it's wonderful. But come at 9.30. Start, start a little earlier here. So, but that's why when you understand the sacramentality of the mysteries, this is the greatest help for us to make progress in the path of holiness. Not because it's a Freudian council session. God takes care of the rest of it. And that's why it doesn't, the, the priest may be an absolute imbecile. It has, nothing really to, it has nothing to do with that man. It has everything to do with the Spirit of God. And I'll tell you, and every priest will tell you that sometimes you have people come up to you and they'll catch you after Mass or they'll catch you a following week. You'll be at coffee and donuts and they'll say, No, Father. I went to confession last week, and what you told me was absolutely magnificent, and it hit the spot. And when you think about last week, oh, well, that's, the, that's after the second Mass, in, going into the third hour of hearing confessions, and I know that I'm just kind of like, going, la, 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 because you're just, you're human, right? So, and that is when God speaks, because the man's gotten out of the way, because he's actually, you know, just tired. And that's always a wonderfully humbling story to know that it's not because I'm brilliant in counseling. It's because the Spirit of God comes in its fullness in that sanctifying grace which expels the sin. That's the absolution. Remember, absolution does not mean forgiveness. The word absolution in Latin means breaking bonds. Absolvere. Marriage being indissoluble, unbreakable. Absoluere. Absolvere means to break the bonds that have shackled you until this moment. So think about the, with the gospel coming out this Sunday, because this is the this is the Sunday of the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. If actual grace is confirmed, so it's a disposition towards the future that calls these graces down. Yes. So what is the source of sanctifying grace? Is it just God. God, and in this case, the mystery itself. The mysteries, remember, are efficacious signs. We're, we're getting ahead of the game, because this will be in the book. But the, the, the mysteries are not just ceremonies. They are efficacious signs accomplishing what they portray. You know, they are the presence of God within our lives. Okay? Take a little break to win a little bit later. So. To the mystery of penance in its application. So, um,
That's why he has a paragraph three there on page four. That repentance of the heart no, calls I mean, for the grace of the sacrament I'm to attain its purpose. She had milk and cereal. <laughs> yeah, but the cookies are much better. Uh, we all know. <laughs> so, so you notice what he, how he links that the virtue of repentance finds its fulfillment in the divine mystery where Christ says to us, I break your bond. I break, I give you absolution. I break these bonds. That's why he says here that the, the repentance of the heart, conversion, calls for the grace of the sacrament to attain its purpose. And then he mentions here, the ones we talked about, contrition, purpose of amendment, you have the heartfelt regret. Next line he mentions, confession. And then the third one you have, atonement. Those are the three things. So when you ask the question about someone who comes in who doesn't have real contrition for their sins, well, those three elements must be present or will always be invalid. And someone can say, yeah, you know, I actually stole from this person, it was really bad, you know, and I smashed up his car, I stole it and smashed it up. And so you confess it that you've done that, but you don't have any intention of amending, in other words, fixing or replacing the car that you've destroyed. If you don't have a purpose of amendment, that would also make the sacrament invalid. And so, but quite honestly, it's happened, you know, it can happen. So if I have an instance where, just by the way they're telling you, you know that they're not really intending to correct any of this, I will ask them. You know, you ask them indirectly, you ask them in a gentle way, um, and then you lead them into it and say, well, look, you know, it's very good that you came and presented this now, but you're not at the point to actually amend. And so I can't... I could pronounce the words of absolution over you a thousand times, and it would do nothing. And that's where, when we talk about this divine presence within the mysteries, this is the reality, but it is not magic. In other words, we don't just pronounce the words, and now you're clean, and you go off, because always the reciprocity of person to person. During the break, we were talking about someone talking about my personal relation with my Lord and Savior. The only place where you're going to find a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior is in the presence of the person, which is only found in the divine mysteries. Otherwise, the rest of it's just fantasy in my head. This is like saying, you know, I have a personal relationship with my second cousin and I never talk to her. I never call her, I never do anything. I mean, certainly never go out. She lives around the corner. Mm -hmm. But I feel good about my relationship with her because I really love her. <laughs> And you're like, well, but, you know, our Lord makes himself presence in these mysteries. You know, that's why they are pivotal points in people's lives. So anyways, the, the patriarch links in this paragraph the virtue of penance to the divine mystery. Now we have the next one in, in paragraph four. The true and fr fruitful repentance is the realization of sin in its essence and its causes and its consequences. This is not the question of feelings. This is the question of conviction. That I know what I have done is wrong. With Lolo the other day we were laughing because culturally in Mexico, if you don't break down crying in the confessional, you're not repentant, but it's true, right? It's, it's, a, it's a cultural, it's a cultural, no, in many ways it's quite beautiful. Apparently, you We're know... We're really, really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, if you're hearing confessions down in Texas or you're in New Mexico, you have to have wailing on the other side of the screen or sniffling and sobbing. And it's actually quite beautiful, but clearly at some point, I don't know if that's from the Franciscans or if that's the only way they actually got the Aztec heart to actually turn it towards the gospel. Okay, but if you people, you're still thinking about ripping hearts out. So if you're not crying, you're not really turning to the Lord Jesus. And so it's a wonderful thing, but, but it's beautiful, and we can smile about it because everyone understands it deep down. It's not about whether I break into tears. It's the conviction of whether this is wrong or not. And so, you know. That's why it's not the question whether I feel. I know that smashing my cousin's car and stealing it, or stealing it and smashing it, there is profound death. I still don't like this guy. 
But what I've done to him is gravely wrong. And I have to actually, I have to actually admit this before the divine light with the purpose of replacing his car. And that's hard because you're like, I, 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 oh. well, at some point you have to think about the, the consequences of your actions beforehand. And so he has the three things down here which just relate. So the essence of things, the causes of them, and the consequences. Same causes, you know, the principle, same cause, same effect. Same cause, same effect. If you just go, that's why the purpose of amendment is important, because when I go back into the same situation, I'm just going to do the same thing. It's why you can't have somebody who's living in concubinage or adultery come in and confess their adultery and then go back to the same house with the same person, because you're just going right back to the same situation. You're either not actually repenting of it, or you're not understanding what repentance means. And so, it's not a feeling at this point, I feel remorse and I feel bad about this, and I'm going to go back home, you know, and see Fred tonight. And so, this is the, the question of the, the transformation, the consequences that take place. Do you notice about the fourth line down, the patriarch says that this reconnects the heart, the mind, and the will to God's gifts and forgiveness. This repentance reintegrates people into a wholeness because we know the illusions that we live under. We make excuses for all kinds of things that we do. But it's by this virtue of penance and the mystery that we begin to reintegrate, connecting what's in our heart, what's in our mind, what's in our spirit, what's in our will. This is the reintegration within the divine light and the divine will. I, for me, this is profoundly beautiful. I mean, you know, this is, when we talk about the therapeutic grace of healing, that's what it is, this healing. It makes us whole again. Instead of the brokenness and the woundedness that are given to us, bequeathed to us by Adam and Eve and passed down through our ancestors on the natural plane. So I mentioned, you know, a few weeks ago, I said, you know, every baby that we give birth to is going to die. But our Lord elevating the sacrament of matrimony, but the children who are baptized within that divine reality are destined to be the children of God. So at that point, I don't have to feel guilty that the creator I gave life to is just going to die. But every baby born into the world is going to die. It is, that, is, that is the plight of the children of Adam. And this is the reintegration of the wounds, mind, heart, spirit, and body. This is why it's going to lead into the practice of fasting. Our bodies are completely engaged with what we do. And I'm not just talking about sexual sins. Our bodies are completely part of what we do. How we bow, how we genuflect, how we pray. All of these things are reintegration, bringing us back into this wholeness, which is God's original intent for us. This is paradise. This is what God originally... Remember the word paradisos in Greek just means garden. This is God's original intention for the human race, is this integrity of body, mind, soul, spirit. Everything elevated into the divine light, and that is what's ruptured and broken in the very first generation with Adam and Eve. Which is why, if you notice our prayers, the season of announcements and the season of love, less so these first weeks, we talk about the return to paradise. The Syriac vision of penance and conversion is the return to paradise. We want the reunion that was originally created for us as human beings in Adon. To find this wholeness and this intimacy of speaking with God in the garden. Right? So the vision of paradise is a Syriac vision. And so the paradox in all of this is that those who think that they're being quite free and independent and know, etc., they're actually, they plunge into the despair. The world looks the way it is because of the illusion that I can take my fragmented and wounded human nature and rest on it completely. I can't. It's wounded. It's like saying, yeah, I broke my leg last week, but I'm still going to run the marathon next Tuesday. Mm -hmm. You can have all the intention of doing that, but it's going to be a disaster. And you are probably going to make that break worse than it was last week. Alright? 
And so these people who live in an illusion where they think that they're being free and independent, they're actually deepening and deepening personally the wounds that were given to them at their birth through Adam and Eve. So there's a real paradox that goes on here. But to kneel before the divine mystery and admit where I've fallen short, the paradox is, this is what brings me strength and healing. This is what begins to transform me. Okay? And that's the main argument against naturalism. What is the problem of masonry in that is naturalism. The idea that there is only human nature. That this is what we were created for. But in Christianity, you've always understood that we're not created for this world. If you read Genesis, it says that Adam is, Adam is placed in the garden. There's two stories of his creation. One, we all know, he's created from the soil. He's created from the dirt. The other one is that he's placed in paradise to keep it and to tend it. He's introduced into this harmony of the cosmos. So that the destiny of the human race has always been this intimacy of not just simply a natural beauty, but a transcendent beauty to which we are ultimately destined to. And so that's why between Masonry and Catholicism there has always been a fight to the death because both of these are universal visions. The Catholic Church says that every child born into this world is ultimately meant to be healed, restored by grace, and destined towards the divine light of the kingdom, a supernatural goal. Masonry says all there is is nature. You are born into this world to live in this world, and that's all there is. If there's something else, we don't know. Which in practice means, who cares? Yes. Bob, the guy that comes with Nancy, you know who I mean? Bob yeah. Yes. Okay, Bob Wallace. He told Larry a couple weeks ago that oh Masons God. in the Augusta Gardner area have joined, what is it, the Knights? Or... There were a couple of night, the Knights of Columbus Council that has been joined by Masons. How does that work? It doesn't. And in the 1990s, Pope Benedict, uh, Pope Benedict, Cardinal Ratzinger in the 1990s, when he was head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, he clarified that the excommunication for any Catholic becoming a Mason still stands. Still stands. Of course, this is the reverse. No, because my father and Bob's father were actually both Masons. Yes, but for a Catholic who is a member of the body of Christ who becomes a Mason, he's excommunicated. Well, he, wow. he was a Mason before his father was a Mason. But they were Protestants. <clears throat> My father. Yeah, they were Protestants. Right. Yeah. yeah, he was a Protestant. Bob's father. They're already right. excommunicated. I mean, so they're already not in the, full, the fullness of the church because of that. But excommunication means you take a member who's actually in the fullness of Christ's body, and they are denied the sacrament. It's basically a death sentence. If you do not change this, you will die separated from the body and the healing grace of Christ. Yeah. Sounds pretty severe. It's supposed to sound severe. Mm. You read the letter to the Corinthians. St. Paul talks about, you throw this man out of your congregation right now. I can't believe that you kept this man living with his stepmother as husband and wife. This is, this is an abomination. Pagans themselves don't do this. You get him out. The commentators think the reason why they put up with that because he had clout and money. Well, you know, but he's a good guy. And he's not related to the woman. You know, in the pagan world, a lot of these men, you know, they're widowed. They're marrying a woman oftentimes who's 20 years their they're, they're, they're junior. So oftentimes you could have in a situation where, you know, your son from your first marriage is looking at his stepmother, your second wife, and she's probably about the same age. And which is probably what's going on here. This is not, you know, a 20-year-old who's living with some 57-year-old woman. You know, this is a probably a 25-year-old living with someone who's probably, you know, 25. And so why did they put up with that? Because it's still his stepmother. So St. Paul says, you, you throw him out, and if you don't, by the time I get there, you're going to have to answer for it. This is one of those things going on in letters to the Corinthians. But this, this is part of the problem, is because of the lack of the clarity. But what happened again in the 1980s in, in, in the canons, when they changed the Code of Canon Law, they took the name of Mason out of the canon, which dealt with joining antithetical 
anti-Catholic organizations, Masons were always explicitly named amongst others. And the Mason name was just drawn. And so there were some who said, well, see, then it's no longer. But 15 years later, when the question, the dubia, are presented to Cardinal Ratzinger, he says, but the organization is still universally and naturalistic, and therefore antithetical to Christianity. It's still an excommunication. It's like, in 1966, we dropped the index of books. You know, we used to have a list of books that you cannot read as a Catholic. Well, I mean, after a while, there's just way too much printed. There's no way. You know, you could do that in the 15th century. Because they were, you know, a few enough books. Or authors that were condemned. And so, but when Paul VI dropped the actual listing, he reminded everyone that the natural law, the, the divine law, still forbids us from reading things which are hazardous to our faith or our morals. Just because it's not a list of books that you can't read, doesn't mean now you can just go off and, and read, you know, Playboy or something. He's saying, you know, the divine law still requires us to be virtuous. But now we just can't give you a list of everything that's going on. You know, and even now, so more so now with social media and everything. So that's the same argument that Cardinal Ronsinger gave, saying the Masonic name may not be explicitly in that canon. He says, but what is in the canon makes it clear that the Masons are still excommunicated. I see, we're going to have a lot of fun with this class, yes. <laughs> isn't, it the, isn't the official uh, ruling on anything that, it's unless it's juridically abrogated, Kurt? it's yeah. presumed still. that it's still in effect? Yeah. But he hates well, I mean, in this like case, it. it's an interpretation of the law. That's it. So, the law, the law is still there. So, I've got to mention you, so. there's a canon that any, any clergyman who violates the sixth and ninth commandment, whether 16 year old or younger, is immediately stripped of everything. Priesthood, Finance, everything. You're not even given a penny. Nothing's given to you. You have violated one of the most profound. And that was the canon up until 1983. And again, in that code of canon law, the mandatory sentence, which was stripped of everything and that's it, was made not mandatory, but still listed as the consequence subsequent to judgment. Do you think that would have prevented some things? If it no, was because the problem isn't that we've always had zero tolerance of this stuff. The problem is, is the men who are the executives weren't executing these things. That's the problem. I mean, now, of course, with all the rest of us are tortured by constantly having to do updates with videos to being, you know, formatted for this. But it already existed before. It just was not applied. And so Cardinal Rothstein's answers in the 90s was, just because the name is not explicit any longer in the canon, doesn't mean the excommunication is not applicable. Because it defines the antithetical aspect. And that's why I'm saying, that's why masonry, in the 19th century, this is why the Catholic Church always stood in opposition to public schools in the 19th century. Why do you think we created an entire parallel universe? of elementary schools, high schools, and universities. Because they, in the 19th century, you read the letters to editors that the bishops are writing. They said, you will not take and degenerate our children into agnostics or atheists. The terminology is in the 1800s. Well, I think they were learning. Well, because the public schools were very clear. This is a Yankee invention to format you into being a good citizen, a good wasp. And that's why it's once all the immigrants start coming in, all of the Italians and the Irish, and you have all this Catholic scum coming into the, into the, and you're losing its American integrity, you form and then you mandatorily make everyone go until the age of, well, ultimately 16, to go to these schools so they learn how to be good Americans. And the Catholics said, you are not making my child into a wasp. That's why they created an entire parallel system. Mm -hmm. Which was glorious. I mean, it's not, I mean, nowadays it's just some private education with you know, a name tacked on. But even that in the 1990s became a big issue because John Paul II, the issue, you cannot use the name Catholic University without these requirements. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, was it executed? Mm -hmm. No. We're just left constantly, you know, into this constant confusion of things. But the teachings are very clear and the decisions, they're still coming out. But who's aware of them? So is Boston it, College not Jesuit? It's, I think it's still Jesuit. So, You're asking if it's Catholic. God yeah. knows. 
Yeah. No. What are you saying? No. At St. Xavier in Chicago, my uh, <coughs> ethics class, well, they start off uh, reading that wonderful uh, uh, writer that wrote all about ethics by the name of Karl Marx. Yeah, you know, you would study these documents, but as Catholics to understand the errors in them. And that's not what's happening now. You just simply, it's all over the place now. And he was we're getting off track on education, but <laughs> it's not understand. The reason between the, so we give the example because what, what the patriarch is pointing out here, this paradox of naturalism, the vision that he's giving us is the Catholic vision of a supernatural goal. We have a destiny and a reason why we exist in this world. Mm -hmm. And I've mentioned to you numerous times, it's why these are called parishes. It comes from the Greek word meaning travelers. We're not here permanently. We're just moving through. We're a community of travelers on our place to somewhere else. That's what parochia means. <coughs> that's what a parish, that's what parish means. We're not here permanently. We're on the move and we're going someplace else. Look in the front of the book when we looked at the table of contents, talking about the kingdom, <coughs> the present, but not yet. We're always in a question of a goal in the movement because our goal is supernatural. The Masonic vision is you are here, and this is it, make the best of it. And it's a totally different vision. And because for the ch church, the ultimate destination is universal <coughs> for all human beings ultimately to be baptized into the body of Christ, that's a universal vision of a supernatural goal of life. And masonry as a universal goal of human nature is there's only nature. They have two universal goals. They both encompass all of humanity. One has a natural rooting, and one is destined towards a vision of a supernatural goal of faith, hope, and charity. And that's why there's always been a clash. Unfortunately, culturally at this point, the Masons won. They were not winning in the 19th and early 20th century. They have definitely won now. That's why masonry is dying out, because you don't need to be a mason in a secret society. Everyone thinks like a mason now. Why join a society? You don't need anyone. And if you want, you can see, I told you of the book written in 1905 by Monsignor Hugh Benson called Lord of the World. It's a presentation of the Antichrist. In a very good, not yellow journalism, but it's a very Catholic vision of what the Antichrist would very well look like. And the Antichrist and the Lord of the World is a wonderful, beautiful, kind, he looks like poverty war, against poverty <laughs> warrior sorry. who goes around the world feeding the poor. That's the Antichrist. And you see how the Catholics are portrayed as absolute lunatics. Now this is being written by a Catholic priest. You see the psychological shift. In well worth reading. It's still in print. It's been in print since 1905. The Lord of the World. By whom? Monsignor Hugh Benson. Hugh Benson. It's a small novel, a novella, if you want. And it winds up being the competition between the Antichrist and the last pope. This is great stuff. This really motivates you to be serious about your family. You know, we are surrounded by, you know, anyway. But our Lord, but this is what our Lord says at the Last Supper, right? He says, I do not pray for the world, but I pray for these for whom you have given me out of the world, that you protect them. The idea that Jesus runs around hugging every single man, woman, child, rock, bunny, rabbit, and tree just because he's Jesus is not the vision of the gospel. Otherwise, how could he ever say, I do not pray for the world? And in fact, within that same talk with the apostles, he says, look, don't be surprised. They hated me. So this absolute obsession with being friends with the entire world since the 1960s has not been a good path for Catholics. And now, you know, like we say, if you do polls, Catholics are the same, they vote for abortion, they do the same, they have the same divorce rates, they have the same abortion rates, and they have, and the vast majority of Catholics don't believe in the Eucharist. No. So, what is it? It's a ceremony like going to, you know, a Lutheran service, and you know, it's just I do this because I'm Catholic, and you know, my sister, my, my brother-in-law does that because he's, he was born a Lutheran. But that's not the vision. Otherwise, why did God enter the world? I mean, never, it's, it's all about presence. Okay, so having gotten off of another tangent there, that's <laughs> <laughs> tangent four thirty-eight. That's right. 
but it's connected with this question of the reintegration. You cannot be reintegrated if it does not include grace and ultimately the vision of paradise. That's why we said every living, conscious human being is either in the state of grace or in the state of mortal sin. There is no third possibility. Okay? Part of naturalism that infects Catholics is they think that the faith is polishing the natural world. Just making it a little nicer. We, we say the rosary on occasion or something. It's not a transformation of the way we see things. So it's important to understand that grace is not just a polishing of the way things are. Grace is quite revolutionary, in fact, when you actually understand what's going on. It's why it transformed the entire Western world, was the faith. Okay? And so, a lot of the Catholic vision now is, well, just make it a little nicer, and that'll be a disposition to grace, and everyone's being saved. But that's pure naturalism. You can't merit grace. How can you unmerit the hand of God? No one can make God touch them. And so that's why in the parable this week, and I'm not going to preach on it because it's the gospel and we're doing the epistle. You'll notice in the parable of the prodigal son, the father never goes out and does anything with his son. He allows him to go out, waste himself with harlots, waste all of his inheritance, and reduce himself to starvation and sloppy pigs. But he does wait for him. He's always watching. But he never makes us be something that we're free to do. And the prodigal son makes all the wrong choices, and he insults his father. But the father is always watching the road for his son to come back. God's anticipation is always the desire that we come back and always the desire, but it's his initiation. So by polishing the world to just make, you know, Junior a little more polite, and the little girl a little more courteous, doesn't merit grace. Grace transforms. You know, the prostitute, which is the tradition behind Mary Magdalene, we certainly know if she wasn't a prostitute, she's some kind of public sinner, and we're told in the Gospel explicitly, she was possessed by seven demons. So she's in a really bad way, you know. <laughs> Grace transformed her. It's not because she became a polite prostitute, but all of a sudden she discovered the rabbi. And that's why the paradox is that sometimes the greatest beginning of, sanctify, of sanctification and holiness are the depths of despair. How many of people have converted because of the destitution of a funeral and a death within a family? Yeah. Okay. So that's why, just to give you an example of, grace is not just an icing that we put on top of a really pretty world. Okay. Again, that's a Catholic notion, but it's one that we don't usually think in those terms. All right, so then on page five, that this repentance, the sacramental mystery that we've talked about, is that Jesus had established for all the members of his church who after their baptism, and there are three things you can note here. Number one, who fall into sin. And specifically, grave sin, serious sin, okay? Then you require to go to confession because of the, uh, what we call mortal sin. We have lost the grace of God. We have lost this union with God. So, that's why he says, thus, too, losing the grace of their baptism. St. Jerome refers to the sacrament of penance as being a plank in a shipwreck. You've wrecked the boat, but there's still something for you to grab on so you don't drown and die definitively. But that's why the key there is the question of grave sin. And then thirdly, it damages their communion with the church. <coughs> and that's actually one of the good things in the last 40, 50 years, is that in the development and greater teaching catechesis about the sacrament, the mystery of penance, is the reconciliation with the church, the body of Christ, has been put in the greater relief. And that's a good point, right? 
So I want you to think that every single thing that's happened in the last four years has been you know, devastation. That's not true. And this idea of the, of the fact of we break with other members, you cannot break with God without breaking with the members of Christ around you. No one can go into sin without dragging others down with them, and no one can enter the life of virtue and grace without raising others around them. And I don't mean the people that are immediately around you, because the influence of God's providence, who knows? The day of judgment, we'll see if my fidelity has done something. Or on the day of judgment, we'll see that what I thought was only a private affair has dragged down, you know, this many people. That's what the day of judgment is for, is to show the full repercussions of our choices. Because if I, you know, we talked about the mixed marriage thing when it's confused, so the daughter comes up Lutheran and he's going to be, he's going to be Catholic, and in the end they don't have any religion at all. They go on to have their children. And they go on to have their children. And they go on to have their children. It's not until the day of judgment that your 47th descendant because choices that you made in 1987 will have repercussions echoing down through all those generations. So it's not just genetic connection, you have moral and ethical connections that sets them on a track. A man who may inherit well, who has done well with his family, you put it on a natural level, and who goes back to the question of gambling. Those children are going to be born and educated in a system which is already wounded because he's already wasted all the money. Children aren't guilty in this. But his choices will have repercussions down through his grandchildren, his great-grandchildren, his great-great-grandchildren. And now we talk about the fact, we talk about now the trauma genetically within people. Can you carry the wounds even of trauma of a previous generation? Well, we know you can by faith because we talk about the wounds of Adam and Eve. That's why Judgment Day is necessary because the full ramification of my choices won't be worked out until time stops. Isn't that sobering? Yes. And that's why the Day of Judgment is not just to make a show. <laughs> it's because now we're going to manifest how God's providence has worked. This is going to be the moment of the justification of the Lord God of hidden life. Okay? So that has brought us up to reconciliation and we are done. We will come back to this next week. This is actually a pretty good length in there. Awesome. Obviously. Okay, any questions? Great. All right. Great, but, yeah, there's a question. So we may be a small number, but we're thick of the crop. Yes, this is good. <laughs> yes. Um, earlier, you, it is my understanding in the Roman church that when a couple marries, <coughs> a couple, they are the ones that administer the covenant yes. to each other, and the priest is just a witness. In the official witness, yeah. That's why, deacon, said, that's why deacons will witness Latin marriage. But you said that that is different. In the Maronite church, <laughs> all the Eastern men. That's why you'll never see an Eastern deacon ever witness marriage. That's all oh. the Okay. Well, the different visions. Remember, two people to read the letter. Yes. And the longer they've been away, the okay. more that that will be a challenge for your Lenten resolution. Oh, I know two very nice people. <laughs> that can be done, everybody, but the Maronite specifically, because this letter, this letter is from their father. That's what patriarch means. To the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit, Amen. O oh God, you are before all ages, and exist from age to age. You are resplendent in the power of passion to the search of all life. Through your word, you bring forth life and give us each day. O radiant day, the source of all life, we glorify you, adore you, and offer you praise night and day. Accept our praise and answer our prayers. Send us your abundant blessings through the mercy of your Messiah. To the end of the new and holy spirit, we glory, honor, power, and thanksgiving now and forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, and to the Lord, 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 and to the L
Our Mary, conceived without sin, pray, pray for us. Divorce to you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Have a good evening. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs>